would be following up a little bit on the questions I just uh, presented. Canada is known as a country of uh, tolerance and acceptance around the world. And we assume that this has always been the case. I don't come to this story of the Kumagata Naru through personal experience or family contacts or cultural knowledge. I come to the story of Kumagata Naru through shame and embarrassment of learning about the Canadian government's history of non-acceptance of others. Before I try to clarify this term, others, I'd like to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about this course that I've created at Mount Royal. It's Anthropology 2229. It's a course called Anthropology of Race. Anthropology is a study of many aspects of humans, uh, their kinship systems, their gender relations, their communicative patterns, their genetic constitutions, cultural developments. Essentially, how humans and their primate cousins <coughs> and their ancestors relate to and live in their natural environment. The word race in this course title is placed in quotation marks because it's a loaded term that carries much interpretive baggage. It is a social, a biological, or another kind of term? How does it relate to ideas of ethnicity? geography, culture, type, nationhood, major group, or species. It is a loaded term that carries much historical baggage. For example, of the Sikhs who traveled on the Komagata Maru, hoping to be accepted on the shores of Vancouver, or the Chinese who committed their energies to building the Canadian Pacific Railway, only to be charged in ever increasing head tax and later to be legislatively excluded from immigrating to Canada. Or of former East Europeans or Japanese who were incarcerated into enemy alien camps or internment camps during the First and Second World Wars. When this course was first structured and taught in 2007, its focus was on two broad issues, the debate of whether the term race should be used as a social category or a biological fact, and the detailed historical development of biological anthropology, which emphasized descriptive classification and type labeling of human groups. Note that biological anthropology is one of four subfields of anthropology that focuses on human variation, adaptation, and evolution. These attempts by early scholars to describe the variability they saw in the human species were initially based on skin color, but soon skin color was not the only criteria. Other physical characteristics assessed qualitatively, measured quantitatively, personality traits and cultural behaviors became discriminators of difference that then supported fixed hierarchical rankings of people, often separating others as inferior or lower. The study of human variation in biological anthropology started too simply as a black versus white dichotomy. 19th century monogenists saw the human community as one species where physical variations were a result of environment or geography. In contrast to the more extreme polygenists who considered physical or cultural differences to represent, in fact, other human species, or more bluntly, relatives of apes. In these early phases of this anthropology course, I emphasize biological themes. Descriptive classification, interpretation of historical types, human genetic diversity, anthropometry or craniometry, the measurement of the human body or the human skull, brain size and its application in intelligence testing. I also discuss the historic acceptance of eugenics policies resulting in global sterilization, 
maiming and killing of people who were simply different from those individuals or groups in power. That is an important point. Individuals or groups in power often define who is different, why they are different, and why they should be treated in a certain way. For the story of the Komagatu Maru, the power players were Prime Minister Robert Borden, H. H. Stevens, Member of Parliament for Vancouver and anti-Asianist, and Malcolm Reed, Vancouver's supervisor for the Immigration Department. On May 23, 1914, 300, the 376 passengers, all British subjects, who traveled on the Komagatu Maru across the Pacific Ocean from Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Yokohama to Vancouver, British Columbia, learned that they were not allowed to disembark the ship on their arrival to Canada. The power players refused to give passengers specific reasons why they could not disembark. They did not allow the passengers to have legal representation during the first week of their incarceration. They eventually allowed passengers to consult a lawyer, but not in private. They did not allow Gurdjit Singh to sell his coal cargo to cover some of the ship's charter costs. They refused to give water and food provisions to the passengers. This last point's been part of the debate, and they rejected the law that states that every British subject is allowed his or her own immigration hearing. Something was missing in this biologically based anthropology race course. For one, there was little Canadian content. I have never experienced racism. And I know little of racial hatred perpetrated on Canadians, on others, on immigrants, on refugees, people of many, many nationalities, ethnicities, cultures, <clears throat> and if I dare to use the term racial backgrounds. In school, I learned of Canada's consistently tolerant and welcoming nature, and of its international image of promoting this multicultural character. Without much theoretical background on the subject of multiculturalism, in the Anthropology of Race course, I created a, a metaphor, sort of a soft metaphor, to describe the difference between multiculturalism in Canada compared to our neighbor, the United States. The U.S. is identified as a melting pot. People from around the world come to that country, retaining some of their cultural, linguistic, and religious traditions, but mostly would change in quotation marks to become American. I, I perceive a sense of loss of one's own cultural character, but I have no idea if that's the right perception. In comparison, here's the soft metaphor, in comparison I would describe Canada as a salad bowl, containing, respecting, and carrying on the distinctions of various cultural, linguistic, and religious traditions. Yes, we have our carrots, we have our lettuce, our sprouts, our cabbage peas, our various seeds. And together, we all, in the frame of that wooden bowl, represent the well-honored Canadian mosaic. That cultural pluralistic mosaic is now part, a very central part, of the anthropology course, including stories of racism, against the passengers of the Komagata Maru. I now return briefly to the idea of the other. In early 2000s, international Polish journalist Ruziar Kowczynski, who grew up during the Soviet occupation of his homeland, gave a series of lectures on his perception of the other. He reflected in a very small book of these presentations <coughs> that historically others were people deemed non-Europeans, thus continuing the colonialist perspective that Europeans or Caucasians were superior. In fact, 
this idea of Caucasian comes from a biological anthropologist. Johann Blumenbach, who in the late 1700s proposed that, quote, the most primitive, natural, and beautiful, unquote, or perfect form of human came from a region near the Caucasus Mountains, thus establishing the term Caucasian. Kapuscinski's modern interpretation of the other is more open and acceptable. And I really like this quote because of the reference to a ship. He says, quote, we are all in the same boat. Every one of us living on this planet is another in the view of others. I am in their view, and they are in mine. This perspective emphasizes the importance of self-identity and promotes a core value in anthropology, that is, cultural relativism. The idea that, quote, we must suspend judgment of other people's practices in order to understand them in their own cultural terms. I want to digress ever so briefly and just say that in that quote, that word other is suspend judgment of other people's practices. I don't think it's necessary, personally, to include that word other. I think that word other distances us. I think that that quote could work just as well without, that, without the use of that word. The story of the Komagatu Maru is one that is embedded in yet another term in anthropology, ethnocentrism, or the, quote, belief that one's own culture is superior to all others. According to the power players in this tragedy, the Komagatu Maru passengers were deemed undesirable. Great title for uh, Kazim's book. A 1907 article in the Pacific Monthly, one of many magazines that preached that Canada's open door policy would result in a flood of, quote, brown tide, gave this awful example. Have you ever watched a band of sheep in a rocky and barren field? Pasturing until the grass has been eaten down to the roots. You will see the sheep gathered near the fence, and look longingly at the luxuriant bunch grass in the next field, while they march back and forth along the fence line in hope of finding a chance to get into the grassy pasture. India, densely packed, densely populated, excuse me, plague-smitten, famine-stricken, is that overcrowded and overpastured field. <clears throat> British Columbia and the United States are the green fields toward which the ever-hungry hordes of India are eagerly looking. Racism is central to the Komagatu Maru story. The Canadian government initially restricted immigration from India with an order in council on the 8th of January 1908 that prohibited immigration of persons who did not travel directly from their country of birth or citizenship by continuous journey. As well, the Canadian government demanded that the Canadian Pacific Steamship Company, which had a lucrative business between India and Canada, stop direct service between Calcutta and Vancouver. A later constraint was that every person of, quote, Asiatic race was required to carry the exorbitant amount of $200 cash on entry into Canada. What can the Komagata Maru teach us? The Komagata Maru can stand as a touchstone, as one of several episodes of Canadian race relations that, in my opinion, do not support the notion of Canada as a tolerant and accepting society. What, I, what do I want students to learn in the Anthropology of Race class? I want students to reflect on Canada in terms of race, race relations, issues of discrimination and prejudice, and of ethnocentric beliefs 
that still haunt and affect our communities today. I want students to recognize that now is time for change and for them to be part of that effort. The time continues for change. In the past 15 years, the federal government has provided apologies and compensation for some groups, but not all. And under formal circumstances in Parliament, but not always. Public exhibitions of not whitewashing Canada's so-called, so-called dark sign are starting to be presented. The Komagata Maru website out of Simon Fraser University and supported by the Department of Citizenship and Immigration, the commemoration of this 100th anniversary. The Parks Canada display in Banff on local internment camps for enemy aliens. And the stories of immigrants, for example, at the Museum of Immigration at Pier 21 in Halifax, where about one million people entered Canada. These are all now being heard. And yet, on Tuesday evening, September 16th, 2014, I listened to a story on CBC Radio's As It Happens program where in an interview with Dr. Karen Busby, a law professor at the University of Manitoba, was being asked about a story in the Winnipeg Free Press. The story was about how to interpret the actions of Federal Minister of Heritage Shelley Glover, who wanted to review the public exhibitions of the new Canadian Museum for Human Rights, opening officially, excuse me, opening officially a few days later. Was Miss Glover simply finding content for her expected opening speech? Or was she, as it was stated in the Winnipeg Free Press article, reviewing exhibition content to make sure that the federal government was viewed in a positive light? According to Dr. Busby's research and upcoming book on human rights museums, governments, only, uh, gov governments often interfere with human rights museums to promote the interest of the state. She ends the interview with a thought-provoking example. In a Freedom of Information and Privacy request, and I'll just clarify here, not made by her, but she had access to the materials. In a Freedom of Information and Privacy request for documents about the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, she received 500 pages of redacted information with sensitive details removed. One available detail that was made was about gallery profile information comparing 2012 to 2013. On the topic of refugees, in 2012, the museum ex exhibition stated, quote, refugees escape threatening situations to come to Canada, have little control over their acceptance in the way they are portrayed in the media, unquote. In 2013, this content was simplified to, quote, Canada is recognized around the world as a safe haven for refugees, unquote. Dr. Busby acknowledges that both of these statements are true, but that the 2013 statement loses the lack, the idea of the lack of control. Only the celebratory message about Canada is given. She then asks the question, how does the museum deal with controversial issues? Her example, health care for refugees, which is no longer paid for by the Canadian government. So if Canada is a safe haven for refugees, but no information about health care for this group is provided, then as Dr. Busby says, this is a lost opportunity for the museum to discuss and educate about human rights. What is the final point? In our ever-expanding global community, we need to recognize and know Canada's history of non-acceptance of others. For what we understand from the past will help to create and frame our future, as long as we are willing to talk about the top issues. Thank you very much.